we welcome back Dr. Richard Carrier to Crackenford. He's got a PhD in the history of philosophy from Columbia, a published philosopher and historian, has articles uh, in many books and journals, uh, teaches courses online, regularly blogs, very busy man. Um, I'll link all his social media links below. Um, he's been called by my viewers here. He has um, a rare and independent scholar, always interesting and informative. And you've been, uh, someone said you had the mind of Sherlock Holmes. So uh, <laughs> not, not quite, but okay. <laughs> but welcome back to uh, Crack and Ford. Uh, okay. um, so you call us quite a stir in, in videos. As I say, we don't normally talk about Abrahamic religions. So uh, the audience was quite excited to hear what you had to say. Lots, lots okay. of feedback. Lots mm -hmm. of good positive cool. feedback and the odd fundamentalist coming in to spoil the party, which is a... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, here we go. So I've got, got a question first, which is geographically topical. Now you've moved. So now you're in California near Hollywood. If you had the chance to be in Da Vinci Code 2, who is this Jesus oh. bloke or where it's called? There actually was, already was a Da Vinci Code What's 2, that? so we would oh, have right. to see. Oh. There might even have been a three. I don't know, but let's oh, yeah. anyway. I get your I get your point. Continue. So, so you, <laughs> you've got the opportunity to go into the Vatican Library um, to discover something. Do you actually think there's anything of secrets in there, or do you think they've probably destroyed anything that would spoil the party of Christianity? Yeah, I mean, I I doubt there's anything we'd find that would be relevant to ancient history. There might be all kinds of scandalous things in there about recent history. Uh, <laughs> But, um, but no, I, I imagine if they had anything significant, they would have destroyed or lost it by now. Um, it's very unlikely. Uh, yeah, I think it's it, it, a better story would be that there's actually stuff uh, buried under the ash at Herculaneum. We actually have a whole library there. Uh, and although I, it's very unlikely there'd be any Christian materials there, but there would be things there that would be of great value to the history. So for instance, Pliny the Elder, who actually died during the eruption of Vesuvius trying to rescue people because he was a naval commander just across the bay. Um, and um, his history, you know, now if you've got like a famous naval commander across the bay and your library is probably gonna have his books, right? Like it's, it seems unlikely that that would not be the case. Uh, and he wrote a complete history of Rome, um, one year for every year of Rome covering the, the emperors and he was, an eyewitness to Nero's reign, right? So he actually was there during the burning of Rome in, in 64. And so he would have had a whole account of what happened. So if Christians were burned for that, if Christians were uh, taken down as arsonists for that, as, as a passage in Tacitus now claims, uh, we should have an extensive discussion of it. And so we should have actually more information about Christianity there. I suspect it won't have anything about Christianity in there because I think that passage actually has been doctored over time. I think originally Tacitus was talking about a different Jewish rebel group that had nothing to do with Christianity. And I suspect that's what you find in Pliny the Elder's uh, actual history because I think we know Tacitus used Pliny the Elder's history as his source. So, um, so that would be like an invaluable thing to go get, right? Uh, to learn something. So, and you, if you're writing like fiction, if you're doing like, you know, Dan Brown kind of stuff, you could pose all kinds of wild things could be discovered in there. Uh, you know, like, I, I don't think those things are likely, but the likely things are like what I just discussed, where uh, that is something we could find that could significantly change our understanding of Christian history. And that's, that's interesting. So this is a question. So you've mentioned about Pliny not knowing who Christians were. So, uh, and he wrote to the emperor saying, what do I do with these? Yeah. Right. Christian. He'd only vaguely heard of them. He had no idea what they believed or why they were even supposed to be prosecuted. Yeah, right. Okay. So Tacitus wrote only a couple of years after Pliny, I believe. So Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and they were correspondents. They were best friends. So they wrote to each right. other all the time. Okay. So uh, and, and in fact, Tacitus often asked Pliny for information to put in his histories. So okay. so if if Tacitus put something in there about Christian beliefs, if that's actually authentic. He could have gotten that from Pliny, who would have gotten it from the Christians that he interrogated, that Pliny interrogated. Uh, so that, that's a, a very likely uh, source chain for that. If, if that's an, if the passage as we have it in Tacitus is entirely authentic, uh, that's a possibility. Okay, that's that's interesting. Yeah, I didn't realize that because I because I, I did I wondered how did Tacitus know about Christians when Pliny didn't, and yet Pliny wrote before. Yeah, but that's the point, right? So yeah. Pliny writes, he says, I don't know anything about these people. So I interrogated some of them. Like he, he brought in some, uh, actually a female deacon, a deaconess, he brought him in and, uh, and I mean, he basically strong-armed her. Like the, the word is like, 
torture, but it, it's it's probably you know they just roughed her up, right? Uh, and to to tell because they thought that there was some sort of seditious shit that was going on, and and he, he responds like all I got out of her was like this ridiculous superstitious nonsense. It doesn't like I don't even understand why we're prosecuting these people, and and even Trajan Emperor that he wrote to wrote back said yeah like kind of you know. It's it's illegal assembly. That was the thing that they decided. It's this is a violation of illegal assembly laws. They're not. They don't have a license from the state to to assemble. Unlike other religious groups, responsibly go get a license from the state uh, to do this. So they thought that that was suspicious in and of itself and can be prosecuted in and of itself. Uh, but it wasn't because of their beliefs. Their beliefs were irrelevant to Rome. Uh, all they cared about is that they were assembling without a license uh, and. And that, that's basically, and Trajan even says, don't hunt these people down, like they're harmless, but you know, if, if you know, they flaunt their illegal assembly, then you have to prosecute them. You know, that was basically the response that Trajan gave. But the point is, is that this is about 110 AD, 110, 112, somewhere around there. And uh, Pliny says he, he got this information and what he learned from this deaconess is like, it's this ridiculous superstition. They worship this, uh, they worship Christ as if a God, you know, like, and so on. Uh, and so when Tacitus writes, like six, four to six years later, and he puts in this little line about Christianity, that could be a line that comes that, that he got from Pliny. He might have written to Pliny or even and said like, hey, or they might've hung out, right? And so like, hey, so there's this, I'm mean, writing about these Christians. I heard, you know, you said you'd like you to uh, interrogated some, what do they believe? And so, uh, so that's entirely plausible uh, chain of custody. It, in fact, the timing makes sense because you have Pliny first does the interrogation a few years later his best buddy who's often consulting him for his history now puts a line in now i actually think the the line about christ being crucified by pontius pilate in tacitus was never written by tacitus i think that's an actually an insertion by later christian scribes but um but i don't depend on that for any of my argumentation i have a whole peer-reviewed article in a journal about that which is reproduced in my book hitler homer bible christ so if people who want to read that peer-reviewed article it's in there Okay, so the next uh, question that came up a lot um, was when we talked about the Bible, especially the New Testament, we, we discussed that um, one, it was written in Greek, and two, it wasn't published in the order it was written, and like, which got a lot of people talking. They said, right. can we read a Bible in its pure form if it, such a thing exists? And if so, do you have any recommendations where people would look Oh, what, what you know, suggest that's a good, that's actually a good question, especially since this is not common knowledge that's disseminated, right? Um, and it, of course, it depends on what you mean by pure form. Uh, the answer is, you know, in the purest sense, we can't because the, the original version doesn't exist. Um, the uh, so, um, David Trobich, who's this major biblical scholar, uh, published a book called The First, I think it was the first edition of the New Testament. Can't remember the exact title, um, but uh, he adduces evidence that shows that all the manuscripts we have for the Bible, uh, the New Testament, specifically the New Testament, all those manuscripts uh, show signs, very telltale signs of deriving from a single edition of all the books published together. So, so that what we call the ca canonical New Testament, plus or minus a few books around the edges, appears to have been published as a single edition. The four gospels were brought together. They were given names at that time and then published together uh, in the mid second to late second century. And all our manuscripts derive from this edition. So that means that there's about a century, half a century to a century of these separate books. They weren't collected together in separate communities transmitting. So there are other redactions and versions of those before this final edition gets published. So we don't have any access to those earlier versions because no manuscripts we have derive from them independently of the edition. So that limits what we can see. And the, some of this is most obvious in places like the Gospel of John, uh, where there's a ton of material that's out of order. There's things missing. Uh, there's stuff that's been inserted. So the version we have is, is a very different redaction from whatever the original version of that gospel was, and we don't have any access to it. Uh, we have a hint, we have this, the, the Egerton gospel. We have this tiny fragment. It's one of the oldest manuscripts of any uh, gospel we have, uh, but it doesn't match our gospels. It, it loosely matches John, but has some slightly different material. Uh, so the suggestion is made that maybe this is a copy from one of the, the lost earlier redactions of John. Uh, we don't know. It could be a later redaction of John, right? You know, so it's hard to say. Uh, we, but it's very fragmentary, so there's not much we can do with it. But apart from things like that that are very vague and you don't know what to do with, and they're very fragmentary, we can't reconstruct the original versions of these books. Um, uh, 
we know, for example, Paul's dossier of epistles. There were more epistles than we have, and they're lost, the ones that are lost. Um, there was an earlier epistle to the Corinthians, preceding 1 Corinthians, um, there's, that's lost. Uh, there was, uh, you know, of course, on the other side of this, we have 3 Corinthians, which is a forgery. So, we have, you know, so there's tons of forgeries to deal with, too. But, um, but in, in, the, in the Bible, about half the letters uh, are forgeries. And, um, but so anyway, there's, uh, so there's other things where like in first Corinthians, it's clear that it's actually a pastiche of several letters. So if, if for people want to see the example of this is read chapter eight into chapter nine and the transition from the end of eight to nine, something's missing. Suddenly we're in the middle of another argument that's unrelated, except vaguely conceptually to chapter eight. So the actual thing that Pliny, or I'm sorry, that Paul is defending himself against the charge is never stated, it's missing. So there's a piece of the letter missing and it's probably a piece of another letter. These are letters that got smashed together. So we're missing so much material. We don't have the original dossier of Paul. Uh, if, if that's something we would want to have, uh, if we really wanna reconstruct what was really going on before the Jewish war, right? Before the 60s AD. Um, so things like that are you know, barriers to us. So, the, so trying to read it in the pure form. And then there's all these other problems with reading it in the pure form. One is we don't, we don't know even the exact text of the one we have, uh, right? So there's um, thousands of spelling errors, there's hundreds of variants, uh, and probably hundreds of variants for which we are not certain what the original is. Uh, and you wouldn't know this, is, this isn't usually indicate, some Bibles will indicate some of these, right? Like for example, the end of Mark, a good Bible will tell you, oh, these last verses aren't in some manuscripts. Uh, and they'll do that for a few verses here and there, but there's actually way more verses than that uh, that have those problems that you don't hear about. And the only way you could is if you, if you can read Greek and you're like, you get the actual Greek edition, right? And, and I'll, I'll show this. If you look at the bottom, there's like little notes down here. These are all the variant, I just picked a random page. <laughs> those are all the variant readings and you can just go page by page and there's almost every page has, variant readings in the Greek in the bottom. And this doesn't even, this is the Allen text. This doesn't even have them all. There's another, if you want to get them all, you got to get the Swanson edition, uh, which is a multi-volume set. So there's like, there's tons of these variant readings. And sometimes we can work out scientifically, logically what the corruption is and what the original is. Um, <clears throat> but a lot of times we can't. And so we, we don't even know the exact text, first of all. We, it, Christians will say, well, we know 95% of it. Like, yeah, but there's a lot of words in the Bible. <laughs> so 5% is a lot, right? To, to not know for sure. Uh, like 95% sounds like a lot, but it really isn't when you're, especially if you're relying on this as the word of God, the inerrant word of God, a 5% 5, a 5 error rate is not a, a good thing to be counting on. Uh, for historians, it's a mild annoyance. We have this problem with all our sources. So we're used to this, but if you're building a religion on it, it's a problem. Uh, and then there's the what books, right? So um, you know, the New Testament we have is the version that they finally settled on eventually, not at the Council of Nicaea. I want to clarify that. A lot of people mistakenly think the Council of Nicaea decided the, the canon. They didn't discuss the canon. It wasn't relevant to them. They discussed creed, which is a whole other story. Uh, the canon was certified, in, you know, like 50 years later, but, uh, but the canon had already sort of uh, not officially, sort of unofficially become the official canon before that. I, I think it was really this orthodox, largely proto-orthodox sect that became the dominant sect that controlled uh, Christianity thereafter, um, they already had kind of decided their version of the Bible by mid to late second century, certainly by the third century. And so there were only a few books on the edges that were in or out like Sirach or uh, Barnabas and things like that. Um, Hermas almost got selected for it and things like that. But um, some of these we have and some of them we don't. Uh, we know we have references to books that we don't have. Um, sometimes we have them, um, but we don't know. We, we can't precisely date any of these things. So we don't know, for instance, let's say you wanted, well, I want to read all the books that are not in the Bible, but written at the same time as the New Testament. Let's say that's what you want or before, right? We don't have that, right? So we don't, we don't know, right? Like, so there's some books like might have been written around the same time as the gospels, maybe. Uh, and even those have been doctored since, so we don't have the original versions. Uh, so it's a vexed problem. It's really annoying to try and figure out, like so the idea of reading the Bible in its pure form is just not possible. Like it's all, all avenues to that have been shut off basically. 
a study in each paper. So what, what is your views on documents like the Codex Sinaiticus? Um, if you're familiar with that. So is yeah. that mm -hmm. less authentic and yeah, is, is that a, something worth? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's yeah. authentic in the sense that, um, I mean, all, all the evidence that it's not a forgery are very good. So it, it is probably what it appears to be, which is a Bible edition produced somewhere around 300 AD or shortly thereafter. Um, 300 to 350, That's it's in that date range. Uh, the Vaticanus, Codex Vaticanus and the Codex Sinaiticus are the two oldest complete Bibles that we have. Uh, and they're both written around the same time. Um, they, ha they disagree with each other in variant readings and stuff. But uh, even in, I think, in contents, like some of them have books, the others don't. But, uh, but they're, it's not a major difference. They're mostly similar. But those represent probably the editions that were being produced by Eusebius. So uh, around the time of the Council of Nicaea or shortly before, um, Constantine asked Eusebius specifically. And now Eusebius was this huge Christian scholar, very famous, influential Christian scholar. He took over the library of Caesarea, which is where, which founded by Origen, uh, the other famous theologian. Um, and so it was one of the, probably the most complete, largest, most influential Christian library at that time. And uh, Constantine asked Eusebius to produce 50 Bibles, you know, New Testaments, basically, Old and New Testaments, and distribute them so that there would be, so, he, Constantine didn't really say, make it official, but he's, it's kind of the idea is, I want these, I want the version that you think is the correct version, and I want you to spread it around, basically. And so he funded the 50 Bible production. Sinaiticus and Vaticanus might be products of this process. Uh, it's entirely possible that even though they, they have disagreements between each other, that could simply be because of the, the scribal teams assigned to them made different decisions. Uh, it's, it's hard to say. Or, or there could be like, these could be copies of those copies. So like maybe Eusebius distributes one then they make a copy and they do their own little changes and stuff. And what we have is the copy of it. We don't know, right? So they don't keep ledgers of where what you know, the, the evidence custody chain or anything is. Um, but they are that early. They're, you know, 300 to 350. Uh, that's still a long way off, right? But these are still copies of copies of copies of copies of that second century proto-Orthodox edition. Uh, so, so that there, it doesn't, you can't use those as like reliable texts. You can't say, in fact, we know for a fact, uh, any scholar, if you look, I'll show you that again, this, this Allen's text, the, so the text above, you know, the text that shows up here, uh, is the text that scholars have determined is most likely the oldest version of that text that we can find. Right. Um, and neither Vaticanus nor Sinaiticus agree with that text. So we know for a fact they have errors in them, distortions and so on. So you couldn't say, oh, I'm going to base my Bible on Sinaiticus. And you say, well, we have tons of manuscripts that show that that's not reliable. So, <laughs> so you can't do that. Uh, to get reliable, you do the scientific study of all the manuscripts and you kind of sleuth your way, you know, you can, you can, you know, uh, um, Sherlock Holmes your way <laughs> to uh, an earlier version of the text, uh, what we call the archetype that, that all these other versions must have you know, been corrupted from. Um, we can do that, uh, but no manuscript that exists corresponds to that reconstructed text. Even though that reconstructed text is the most reliable that we have, it's not perfectly reliable, but it is the most reliable we have, but it corresponds to no actual manuscript that exists. Interesting, that's very interesting, okay. So let's get down to some the, the usual meta subjects in this Jesus chat. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, when was Jesus first mentioned then in history or the, or the Bible? Because I, I hear things in oh. the Septuagint and uh, like there's references. Wait, wait, to when Jesus Christ, you mean the founder well, of Christianity? Well, or? Jesus, someone you'd regard that would become the the Messiah, as, as people say. Right. Yeah. Um, well, it depends on your perspective, I guess. But like historically, like an actual, let's say that there was an actual man named Jesus who, even if he wasn't named Jesus, whatever, if he's the one that they thought was the son of God and, or was the appointed Messiah and was crucified and resurrected from the dead, whoever that guy was, if there was such a guy, I suspect there might not have been, but uh, if there was, um, and it is plausible that there was, uh, if, if there was such a guy, um, the earliest reference we have to him outside um, the biblical materials would probably be, well, outside the Bible, uh, I would say would be First Clement. Uh, so First Clement was in some copies of the Bible for a while, but it's been sort of filtered out, but it's still available. 
Uh, and there's debates over when this was written. It's a, it's a, it's a Christian epistle, so it's still a Christian source. Uh, it's still dependent on Pauline sources. It's post-Pauline. Um, so, uh, and some people, you know, the usual, it's usual thing you say, it says it was written in the 90s AD. I actually think it was written in the 60s AD. Uh, and I, I explain why, and I'm not alone. There are several scholars who think this. I explain why in, um, in my book on the history of city of Jesus, I have a little section on first climate and why I think it's stated early. And I'm agreeing with the scholars who've argued this. And one of the main things is it's not aware of the Jewish war or the destruction of the Jewish temple, even though those would be essential points of its argument, right? So it's, it's making an argument that those would be just gold uh, for, and, and it's, they're not there. So whoever wrote that letter, I think has uh, not aware of that. And that, that would be impossible after the 60s AD. So it has to be early 60s, I think. Um, so that would be one of the earliest references to Jesus. But notably in that letter, Jesus is only someone you meet in Revelations. He's just visions, or uh, even if it's not the apostles seeing visions of Jesus, it's the old ancient prophets, right? So first Clement will quote the Old Testament, but say, as Jesus says, or as the Lord says, you know, as Jesus says, as our Lord says, and so on, he'll quote it, the Old Testament meaning that they think that the prophets that are written in the, you know, the Old Testament are basically the instruments speaking the voice of Jesus. Jesus is whispering in their ear spiritually and, and they're saying this stuff to anticipate his future coming, right? So, <clears throat> so that's from the Christian perspective. The references to Jesus go back hundreds and hundreds of years, right? Because they're speaking through the prophets. Uh, Jesus is speaking through the prophets. Now, a, a secular person doesn't believe that's true. Uh, and the Jews didn't think that was true. So, <laughs> so that's a post hoc invention of an idea. Um, now, outside that, if you ask, like, what is the first non-Christian reference uh, to Jesus? Um, the earliest that's, that is in manuscripts would be Josephus in the Antiquities. Uh, he wrote the Antiquities of the Jews, monumental history of, Ju of Judea and of the Jewish people. Uh, and he wrote it in the no early 90s AD. And there are two passages in there that reference Jesus. Uh, I don't think either of those Josephus wrote. So I don't think they're authentic. Um, that you could do a whole show on the dispute among scholars as to the authenticity of those two references. Um, but if, if you grant them as authentic, then that would be the earliest and that's the 90s AD. Um, <clears throat> and if people wanna go into like why I think that's, that's bogus and how I address the different, or how I and other scholars, I'm not alone, uh, address this. Uh, I have lots of really good blog articles that summarize this on my site. So uh, richardcarrier.info. To info people just go there and you can search josephus in the search screen and you'll find lots of interesting uh, articles and discussions and it's also in my books but uh and um after that uh the next would be uh the next reference to well it's, it would be pliny but pliny never identifies jesus as a historical person he only says that christ is a god uh and he doesn't specifically reference and that doesn't mean that he wasn't told that jesus was a historical person we just don't know he just it, so the source itself what we have doesn't tell us uh so the next reference to jesus as a historical person would be tacitus so now we're looking at 116 a.d um but as i just mentioned i don't think that's that the one line about christ in there i don't think is authentic uh and so what would be the, what would be the next one um Jesus. jesus as a historical person now we're getting to post gospel stuff so like Lucian in the 160s uh, and uh, Celsus, a, a colleague of Lucian's, uh, these are Epicurean philosophers who wrote against Christianity in the 160s AD, thereabouts. Uh, they are the first, I think, to reference Jesus as a historical person where we have, it's undisputed, there's no chance that these are inauthentic passages, but they are explicitly getting their information from the gospels, right? So, so it, this, this is not independent. So that information is useless. They're basically saying, as the gospels say, like, well, okay, uh, th you have no other sources. <laughs> so, so it gets problematic after that. And for people who wanna see the breakdown of all the sources and what's wrong with them, obviously I have a whole chapter on it in On the Historicity of Jesus. Uh, it's weak tea. We don't have, really we have no external biblical corroboration in the sense of an independent source. All our sources, even if you believe Josephus, <clears throat> the, passage, <clears throat> the passages in Josephus, <clears throat> those appear to be derived from the gospels and from Christians relying on the gospels. So we can't get any source that's independent of those gospels. And even the gospels aren't independent. They all just copy each other. So they start with Mark and then they copy and embellish and then they copy and embellish and copy and embellish. So really there's only one source and that's Mark who has no sources. He say, he's, identifies no sources, doesn't identify himself, uh, doesn't even tell us where or when he's writing. He's writing in a foreign language, uh, by all accounts, writing in a foreign land. <clears throat> 
uh, <clears throat> half a lifetime or more after, no, a lifetime or more after uh, the events occurred. Uh, and so, so it's, it's weak tea, let's just say. The, the evidence we have is when you start looking at it, it's much weaker than people think. Uh, and that in and of itself doesn't decisively argue that Jesus didn't exist, but it does put us in a really difficult position historically uh, if we want to reconstruct what really happened. Okay. So whilst Josephus is a large subject, I'd, I'd like to tell <laughs> probably is yeah. the, the first response most amateur Christian fundamentalists give if you challenge the existence of Jesus. So yep. a, they'll cite Josephus. Now, this is the yeah, who said he saw a cow give birth to a lamb or something. There's, oh, that's a different passage. Oh, but a, uh, yeah. But, but uh, <clears throat> got a lot of reliability is what I'm trying to... Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, because what you're referring to there is Josephus has a whole section where he says that uh, there, was, there were prophetic events that foretold that the Romans were going to destroy the Temple of Judea. Now, that's obviously, this is all post hoc, right? Like, it's after the fact. Uh, and they're probably mostly legends that grew up after the destruction of the Temple. They probably didn't, no one was talking about this stuff before. He doesn't cite any sources that predate the war. Uh, but yeah, there's things like cow gives birth to a lamb. There was people who might be interested in talking about biblical manuscripts. Uh, he, he has a reference to the, the doors of the Temple mysteriously opened of their own accord at midnight, right? Uh, and and he, he mentions it as like signaling that the spirit of God then left the temple. That was the God opening it and he just left. And so the, the, the temple was no longer under the protection of God and then the Romans came and destroyed it, right? That, that's his narrative. That's what Josephus says, basically. It's what he implies. Uh, but he says specifically these doors required 20 men to open. That, that's how difficult it was to open these. So it's, it's impossible that they could just open of their own accord. The interesting thing is that we have manuscripts of Luke, the gospel of Luke, that say the tomb of Jesus, the door of the tomb of Jesus took 20 men to open. So that's a very peculiar parallel, right? And we know the gospel of Luke was written using the antiquities of Josephus as kind of like a source text for color content, uh, right? So there's lots of things that are in Luke and Acts uh, that derive from the antiquities that aren't about Christianity, but are around the, the local historical stuff that's going on. And so this line is lit. So there seems to be even someone kept doing that. They kept adding lines to Luke and Acts from Josephus and they grabbed this, they, they sort of equated God leaving the temple and Josephus to God leaving the tomb with that parallel. Like it, it took 20 men to open the, and it opened of its own accord. Well, you know, that's the, you would get the reference if you knew both books, you'd understand what he was saying here. So, uh, th and that's not in the Bibles that you will find on the shelf anywhere, right? Like that's, that's in a, it's in a, a manuscript. So you'd have to go looking to go see, uh, and it would be in the, the bottom part of that Greek book. I just showed you like, it would be in there, but, um, and, and even if it's not in there, it's in the Swanson editions. So uh, it's fascinating. Um, so that, that's an example. You're talking about those parallels. And fundamentalists today will say, uh, well, then our whole Christian prophecy and Jesus's prophecy was all true. Because look, even the Jews said that there were these portents saying that the temple would be destroyed at this time. Therefore, God is acting in the world. And therefore, when Jesus predicted the temple falling, it was actually God inspiring him and not someone inventing that after the fact you know, inventing the idea that Jesus predicted it, you know, uh, as most prophecies are actually written after the fact and backdated. Um, Book of Daniel is a classic example of that. Um, but uh, anyway, so yeah, that, 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 those references don't reference Jesus specifically, but Christians today do use those to try and integrate it into their apologetic. That is true. Okay, so you, you touch on Daniel and, and, and the prophecies then, because there's prophecies in the thing Zechariah as well, I think. So why are Jews writing prophecies of potentially Jesus, as a savior, Messiah, and mm -hmm. then most Jews today don't believe there was a Jesus or the Jesus wasn't, right. so wasn't the Messiah? Worked. Well, it's worth pointing out that there were tons of messiahs, right? Jesus is not alone, especially there was um, specifically because of the book of Daniel, uh, there was a f there was a fever of messiah and claimants uh, of messiahs right around the time Christianity began. So if Jesus existed, if he would be just one of like half a dozen or more of these similar guys. And they were actually, Josephus, the way he writes about it, they were all claiming to be Jesus Christ, Jesus being Joshua, right? So Joshua conquered the Holy Land. So the idea of the Messiah was that there would be the new Joshua, right? Who reconquer the Holy Land. So, right, so, so you'd be the new, the second Joshua. And Christ just means anointed. It means Messiah, right? That's just the same word. So, you know, being a Joshua, a messianic Joshua is a Jesus Christ. 
So all, all messiahs are Jesus Christ's, uh, which, which is one of many reasons why the name Jesus Christ is deeply suspicious historically, <laughs> right? Like, so <laughs> it's very, also, by the way, the name means savior. So uh, it's God's savior specifically. So you've got Messiah, God's savior, who just happens to be proclaimed the Messiah, God's savior, right? So, you know, so it's, uh, there's, the name is, is, is suspicious, but there are a lot of these guys, right? And the, the Jews were anticipating this. This was a thing they expected to happen. They expected the world to end any time now. And they're all trying to calculate when it would end. And the book of Daniel originally wrote this convoluted, uh, so I did this talk, I, I recommend people find it on YouTube called uh, You're All Gonna Die. Uh, or maybe it was We're All Gonna Die. I can't remember what the title is, but it's my Wichita um, uh, Doomsday Talk. Uh, so it was, it was the day that Harold Camping predicted the world was gonna end. It was a few years ago. Uh, and so I was hired to give a speech on the end of the world uh, on the day the world was supposed to end and it didn't. But uh, but I give this speech and it's kind of a humorous speech, but the, the lecture with slides and stuff is all historical re real. And the, the whole thesis of it is that the Jews kept trying to predict the end of the world and that in and of itself caused Christianity. Uh, and it, it, it kept failing to predict the end of the world and that caused Christianity. And one, one of the things that starts with Jeremiah who predicts uh, that the, Israel will be restored, God will return and everything will be fixed. And that didn't come true. And so Daniel comes along or whoever wrote Daniel, it's fake. Dan, the, the Daniel did not write Daniel, but um, so they wrote this, this thing that claimed this lost book of Daniel predicted uh, it, where he, an angel comes to him and explains to him, oh, you misunderstood Jeremiah, let me explain. And so he goes through and like, like did this convoluted math to make the numbers work out so that the end of the world would be right when that book was written, which is around 164 BC, where there was a rebellion against the Greeks. And so to push the rebellion, they said, oh, look, we found this lost book of Daniel that says the world's gonna end, God's gonna come save us, go out there and fight and die for your God and country, uh, that was about. But that didn't come true either. Uh, it didn't happen. So you have two options, declare it false prophecy, or you can do what they did with Jeremiah. And they kept trying to reinterpret the convoluted math. Well, they said, you must have misunderstood. Right. And so that failed. And so they kept trying to recalculate. Uh, and some of the obvious recalculations put the Messiah in the 30s AD. So, and, and or somewhere near there, right? And so, uh, so you've got all these messianic movements between the 20s and 40s. A ton of them, actually, and um, and, and Christianity is right in there. And so it's really that because Daniel failed to predict the end of the world, that they were recalculating Daniel and came to that time as the end of the world. Well, it didn't happen again, and so the, the gospels come along and reinterpret everything as well. Jesus meant like it's going to be until the end of the last person who was alive at that time. In in ancient lore, that was about 120 years. The longest possible lifespan was believed to be. 120. Now, no one lived that long back then, but they thought that that was your maximum lifespan. That's, that's what they did, right? And that, well, then that didn't happen. So then there's constant reinterpretation. And that's what's happened. Every generation ever since they keep reinterpreting it, the failed prophecy of the end of the world. It's been 2000 years now, uh, more than, right? If you go all the way back to Jeremiah. So we're talking 2,500 years of failed predictions of the end of the world, keep driving these religions. And so that's when you're asking about the prophecies, this was inspired by Jewish messianism. Uh, like, like it is entirely, entirely in context, makes exact sense. Uh, and then, of course, other historical events led Christianity to break off from Judaism and become anti-Semitic. Uh, There's a whole historical backstory as to how that and why that happened. But um, that's why it's so different now. It's not a sect of Judaism as it began to be. It, originally, Christianity was, you had to be a Torah observant Jew uh, or you were not a Christian. So that means circumcision, dietary laws, Sabbath observance, like everything, you follow the Torah law uh, to be a good Jew, and then you could uh, have Jesus come into your heart and save you, right? So it was, it was, but Paul comes along and says, well, you know, you don't need to do that. And then of course, <clears throat> that made it super popular because now you don't have to cut off a piece of your penis to join. And so much easier, you don't have to follow the dietary laws or any of these things. So a lot more people joined and the Gentiles really overwhelmed the church and the Jewish faction kind of got pushed out basically. And the version that gained political dominance was the Gentile version. And a lot of what they did because of that is they started becoming more anti-Semitic because of the wars the Jews are fighting against Rome. So if you wanna be friendly with Rome, you have to slag off the Jews, right? So you have to say like, no, no, we're the true, we're the, we're the true inheritors of the, they're the, they abandoned their God and they're like heretics and stuff. And we're the real ones. We're no longer, we're not Jews anymore. Those guys are bad. They killed our old savior, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that anti-Semitism got driven into the church as a political device to try and make themselves more politically a, a 
appealing to the powers that be. And eventually that worked, right? They got the ear of Constantine and, and Constantine won a civil war and basically made them the official church of the empire. And so that that's the history of how we got the Christianity we have today <laughs> and medieval and such Christianity, you know, the very anti-Jewish uh, uh, versions of Christianity. And so that's, that's how we ended up where we are today. Okay, so um, let's go back to the gospels and some of the oddities people have asked about. Mm. Good. So, <laughs> that Jesus isn't the only person who rose from the dead in the New Testament. Also, right. the gospels. Um, do you want to give a quick talk on, on was it Lazarus, possibly? And Yeah, well, first of all, uh, Mark and the other gospels, they have uh, kids. Uh, so there's, Jesus comes along and resurrects someone's daughter, right? Um, for example, that's the earliest one in Mark, um, uh, the daughter of Jairus. Jesus resurrects the daughter of Jairus. Um, and that's, it's all a metaphor for the resurrecting the new Israel under the rubric of the Christian faith and so on. Uh, it's not a true story. It's an allegory. But uh, if you take it as a true story, then that, that was the first resurrection under Jesus's command. Uh, but yes, Lazarus. So uh, the Lazarus one is the most interesting. I have a whole section on this with the scholarship cited in on the historicity of Jesus, but Lazarus begins life in fiction, explicit fiction, right? So Luke, the gospel of Luke tell, has Jesus tell the parable of Lazarus, right? And Jesus tells this story about, uh, and it's clearly fiction. He's just telling a story that's supposed to illustrate a point. It's not a, there's no real Lazarus. This isn't a story that happened, but he says, you know, there's Lazarus and uh, he was, he was a, a beggar uh, who, uh, uh, who was, you know, dying by the city walls, begging for money. And uh, this one guy, this rich guy would constantly walk by him and not through. And, and then the rich guy dies and he's burning in hell. And, and so he's like, oh, you know, for, his, for neglecting uh, the poor. And he's like, oh, that's terrible. And he sees, um, uh, he sees Lazarus. So Lazarus dies also, but Lazarus is up in heaven and Lazarus is resting in the bosom of Abraham. And so uh, for some reason you can communicate from he hell to heaven in this parable. But so the rich man is you know, pleased to Lazarus says, please, you know, uh, have, have Abraham, you know, or God or whatever dip, uh, you know, cool me off just a little, like give me just a drop of, of cool water or something because this is terrible, refuses. And he says, well, then would you at least uh, send Lazarus back from the dead to go tell my brothers what, what the truth is so that they won't end up where I am? And the response is, nope, you've got the prophets. You were told, uh, they've already been told. They don't, even if Lazarus rises from the dead, rises from the dead and goes and tells them, they still won't believe. That's the, the claim. Now, this is an apologetic for why we don't have evidence for any of this. It's like, oh, you wouldn't believe anyway, even if we gave you the evidence, right? I mean, it's a bullshit apologetic. That's not true. That's not how people act. But that's what the parable is about. It's about why, well, why, why doesn't God resurrect people and, and come have them come talk to us and tell us all this stuff? Uh, you know, it's a, it's a response to skeptics. Uh, and so the, this parable was invented. To say, well, no, he doesn't resurrect people to go tell you what hell is like or, or who gets into heaven and stuff because you wouldn't believe anyway. And you've already been told you've got the Bible, et cetera. Well, John, Gospel of John, whoever wrote that, doesn't like this story. The Gospel of John wants there to be tons of evidence, and he wants to nail this into you. So there was tons of evidence, and you ignored it. You know, God sent people back from the dead for real, and they told you, and you li didn't listen to them. So he takes this story and makes Lazarus into a real person who actually does return from the dead and actually does. He's the one who, John says, is responsible for converting millions of, well, millions, but hundreds or thousands of people to Christianity. He's the one who's turning the nation against the Jews because he came back from the dead to tell his story and so on, which is exactly what the parable of Luke was designed to say, explain didn't happen, right? So he's trying to explain why this didn't happen. Now John comes along and claims it did, which is how we know it didn't, right? <laughs> so we know John's making this up, but he's doing this. He's inventing this story as an argument against Luke. He's, he's repudiating the logic of Luke by inventing historical evidence and then berating people for not believing his historical evidence. Uh, and so there's a lot of other parallels in there, like uh, Lazarus rests in the bosom of Jesus in the Gospel of John, to, which is a parallel to him resting in the bosom of Abraham in, uh, in the, the parable. So there's a lot of these connections where it's obvious that John is reifying the parable, turning it into a historical event that you're supposed to believe now.
Uh, and, and there's a various other interesting aspects to it but, uh, that I talk about in there. But so the Lazarus story I find is fascinating how these guys are arguing against each other by different versions of fiction. One is overt fiction and the other is you're not supposed to believe it's fiction even though it is, uh, right? And so there's, it's the way the gospels get written. It kind of illustrates what's going on with these guys, why they're inventing these stories, what arguments they're having. You don't see the arguments, they're all subtext. But if you pay attention, you'll get what the arguments are. Uh, and and it, it makes the Gospels a much more interesting read when you start understanding what, what these things are going on. There's many other examples in the, across okay. the Gospels as well. Okay, so um, that's interesting on the Lazarus story. So I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but so the oldest version of John we've got, from what I understand, is Papua 66. And, uh, oldest, so, I'm sorry, say that again? The oldest version of oh. uh, John we've got is Papua 66, from what I'm aware Okay, of. that might be correct. Yeah. There, there's some research done a couple of years ago where they actually found this version and they studied it and they realised that Mary Magdalene had been crossed out in it and replaced with Martha. So to go from... Uh, I'm not aware of this. Interesting. No, I have not heard about this one. Oh, right. Okay, so... so yeah, yeah. Really go on. Yeah. All that you did is one letter change, change it to Martha and Mary's disappeared from the text. I mean, there's lots of examples of that kind of thing in the, in the exactly. manuscripts. This particular one I've not heard of before, but go on. Yeah, so, tell me about yeah, it. So they've worked out there's about 450 changes described, made, and left obvious to the text, which then went on to become John Proper, I guess. But, so I just yeah, right. Mary Magdalene, considering we had a bit of a Dan Brown moment at the start. Was, <laughs> was she anything? Because if she was left into John, my thought was she would have been a very key character to that. But because she's been taken out and replaced with Martha or, or pluralized into sisters, uh, which was also mm -hmm. done, she's now dropped from John. And that seems yeah. an unusual. Uh, oh, so there's two, two versions, two mentions of Mary slash Martha in John. One is, one is a, an event that occurs during the ministry, and one is an event after the resurrection where Jesus appears to Mary. So I don't know which one uh, you're talking about the replacement. But to your general question, Mary Magdalene, a fictional character. There, there was no such person. Uh, and uh, Bart Ehrman has a book uh, that he wrote that covers these minor characters. It's about Mary and Peter and stuff. Um, I think it's a pretty good representation of why we don't think there was a Mary Magdalene for real. Uh, and there's a lot, the legends of Mary Magdalene, like what people think the Bible says about Mary Magdalene is not at all what the Bible's like. There's no mention of her being a prostitute. That's not in there at all. Uh, the woman who is taken for adultery in John, first of all, is adultery, not prostitution. Secondly, is not named Mary, right? So this, this assumption that those that's the same woman is not at all correct. Uh, that was a later legend that got invented. Um, Mary just seems to be mostly a symbolic character that appears only at key points where she represents it's important to note that Mary is Miriam. That's the same name uh, in Greek. So English just changes it. Uh, but, it, but in the Greek, it's Miriam, which is the sister of Moses. So it's actually a deeply symbolic character. Uh, so the name Mary has deep theological weight to it. Uh, and so it means things. When you, put, when you put Miriam in certain contexts, that signals certain meanings that you only get if you understand that if this is an analog to the sister of Moses, what does that mean about the story? That's, that's how you read the Bible. And then her story evolves over time and that she's used in different ways in the Bible, but it's only after the Bible that she becomes this big legendary figure that they expand out her story and, and sort of basically invent this whole fiction, fictional biography of Mary Magdalene and, and, and different sects use that information differently. Uh, so we get different versions of this, uh, but that's most of that stuff's not in, actually not in the Bible. Okay. So um, talk about other things that aren't in the Bible. We, we touched on this in the last conversation which is that there's no stories of Jesus's life between being sort of basically born and dying. Um, what, why do you think the gospel writers didn't write about that? Because I'm aware of one gospel, if you're familiar with the infancy. Yeah, it's Thomas. More, more accurate. Yeah, there were later infancy gospels. Yeah. Uh, that's more, worth pointing that out. Um, they're ridiculous and bizarre, and I highly yeah, recommend people yeah, read them because they're, they're like ridiculous. This was reverential literature. They're more terrifying than the omen. They make Jesus out to be the horrible person, but they're representing him as great and mighty and wonderful. It's interesting the total value switch that they had. Uh, no, but the original gospels... Uh, an accurate way to put it is they have uh, uh, no stories of his childhood. So you have birth narrative and then you have when he becomes an adult and then on. And so like the, the, you know, from infancy to becoming an adult, that whole part of his life is erased, which is unusual for biographies. Often biographies would put in some childhood stories about the person uh, and, and give you at least even a few lines about what was he doing in, the, you know, in those years. Uh, 
However, it was very common in myth. So a lot of mythical characters have this story structure where that their childhood is erased, where they just you have a birth narrative, then they're an adult coming into their kingdom just instantly. Um, so they have like Oedipus uh, and there are various other uh, significant mythical figures that of which this is the storyline. Uh, Moses, I think also uh, is an example. Uh, and um, so this happened a lot. So it is actually a signal of a mythical biography that you're writing myth. And because for, we don't know necessarily what the reason is, there are a lot of other of these components, by the way, that this uh, it's called the, the hero king narrative. It's very common, it re it's repeated many times. We don't know what the original meaning was of all of these components. So we don't know why it was popular. Um, one of the simplest answers that Dennis McDonald and others have posed is that, that they are deliberately emulating mythic biography in the construction of Jesus because they want Jesus to be the replacement for these other mythic figures. So they, they want Jesus to replace Moses, that Jesus is the new Moses. Uh, so they're rewriting a lot of Moses stories. A lot of stories about Jesus are stories about Moses that are rewritten uh, and where Jesus does things differently or says things differently that's supposed to improve on what Moses did or said. Uh, and same with Elijah, Jesus is the new Elijah and so on. So the idea is that they're also doing this with Greek myths. They're taking this, this common Greek myth, they're creating their version of it and selling it as the one true version uh, and so that, that's why they're borrowing the idea of no childhood because that's they just saw that as a pattern and so they include, that's the idea now eventually you know later they're inventing they're really annoyed by this missing gap the original gospel authors put this gap in there to create this structure uh that, that mimics myth uh but later christians didn't like that they're like no no, no there's there had to be something about him as a child so they they invented these fictions fan fiction as it were uh filling out the missing material, right? And so you have lots of the, these stories come up later, uh, but that's when the historicizing version, the, the, they're getting away from mythologizing Jesus and getting more towards turning him into an actual historical figure, moving more towards biblical literalism, uh, inerrancy and stuff, rather than uh, the original like mythic structure model of, of the way gospels are designed. So that would be my answer to that is why is that, that gap that in there? Uh, over talk and yeah, some people will point to Luke where he, Luke does have a story about Jesus at age 12, Sure. Uh, and you say, well, isn't that a childhood story? It's like, well, actually that's bar mitzvah, right? So that's a, the, at, right at the barrier between 12 and 13 is when you become an adult officially. So really that's a story of him coming into his adulthood. It's not really a childhood story, uh, but it is at least on the borderline of that, right? So, so that's, that's like the first, the first time we start to see something like a young Jesus, as opposed to like Mark, where suddenly he's, well, Mark has no birth narrative. He just shows up as an adult and he begins his ministry. Uh, and Matthew and Luke, they have those, those birth narratives. And Matthew goes straight from birth narrative to Jesus is now in his ministry, his last year, and he dies. Uh, and Luke adds that little bar mitzvah story in the middle. And so uh, John doesn't have any of this either. John, John copies Mark and just has Jesus show up. Uh, but there's no, no infancy narrative there. Uh, John replaces it with a Jesus existed from the beginning of time line, right? So he starts with the opening line. Uh, oh yeah, he's, a, he's the first created being that's been hanging out in outer space for thousands of years. And, and then suddenly he shows up and says hello to John the Baptist, right? Or, or does he even? I think he, I can't remember if he even talks to John the Baptist, but John the Baptist predicts him coming and he does. So, um, so anyway, that's, that's okay. the reasons why these things happen. Good. Okay, so so speaking of things that Mark misses, because he does miss quite a lot, um, in your books, you talk about how, and we talk about how the Gospels were in, you talk about Mark basically copying a lot of the Old Testament. You particularly pull out examples like Psalm 22, which was written hundreds of years before his is repeated. Right. Um, but what, what perhaps most people don't know is, is where Mark ends on, I think it's uh, when Jesus is crucified, goes to the tomb, and the women run away, scared when when the tomb's empty, yeah. and and it ends. Then. And don't tell anyone. I don't tell yeah, anyone. It says they don't tell anyone anything. Yeah, it's a weird way to end a book. So, so yeah, did you want to explain to people what, what that is about? It shows how the Bible has evolved and the gospel has evolved. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's perplexing in many ways. Like, there's a lot of scholarship trying to figure out: uh, a was that how it ended, or was an ending lost? Because uh, we know the version, the ending that we have after that is fake and added later. It does not come from the original author. Uh, I have a full article on why we know that uh, in Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ. So in my book, Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ, I've got a whole chapter on why we know uh, that the longer endings of Mark are fake and added later. They were not Mark and endings. So the debate then is, uh, was there some ending that was erased? right? Like, did, is that where the gospel ended when the women ran away and told no one? 
uh, or was there something lost? So some scholars speculate there was something lost. Um, I've seen some good theories proposed, like uh, the, the last chapter of John looks a lot like a copy of what might have ended Mark. There are various reasons why that is, uh, but we can't prove it. So, um, but then there are a lot of other scholars who come up with really good reasons why the gospel may have ended exactly where we think it did. Uh, and it, it is unusual, but it's not unheard of to end gospel or end stories that way. So they're, they're found literary precedents for it. Like it, it's rare, but it's not unknown. unknown. Uh, and then there's, there's certain logic to it. I mean, you can look at it, it exactly reverses the beginning of the gospel. I talk about this in On the History of the City of Jesus, where you have John the Baptist is fearlessly shouting out the in, in, in a loud voice and proclaiming Jesus. Uh, there are a lot of other parallels. And then you get to the end and then women run away in fear and tell no one. It's the exact opposite. And Mark is full of that, flipping things to the exact opposite. It's um, uh, irony. People call it Mark and irony. Uh, 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 breaking expectation, defying expectation is a thing that Mark does throughout his gospel. It's a literary device he uses all the time. So for him to have that reversal from beginning to end makes thematic sense. It, the idea would be it's calling the, basically it's shaming the reader into going back to the beginning of the gospel and say, don't do what the women did, do what John did. It's, it's a kind of a message, that's kind of the message that's intended. Um, that's one way to interpret it. Now, there've been other scholars who proposed other interpretations that are also interesting in themselves and, and we don't really know for sure. Uh, but, uh, but there are certain things we do know for sure is that like the parallels between the ending and the beginning are there and they're intentional. So, so the question is like, what, what did Mark mean by that? Like, what, why did he do that? What's the point of that? Uh, and, uh, and there's still speculation. And, and a lot of it might have been that, that at that point, that's where the oral preaching would begin. So like, if you were using this book to, to tell the story uh, and then you would say, yeah, and the women ran off and told, uh, didn't tell anyone. Okay. Uh, questions anyone <laughs> right and so the missionary would then orally respond to people and fill things in about the appearances of jesus and how and the creed would go into the creed at that point uh because the creed starts you know starts with the crucifixion and the resurrection and the burial and the resurrection but then there's the appearances and so that would be a whole separate narrative and it's possible that mark intended missionaries to do that part orally and not have it written down uh we don't know uh of course after mark the appearances get imported in. So subsequent gospels just add them. Uh, and so that, so that, that's an unanswered question. We have some hypotheses, uh, but that's, that's it right now. Okay. So in, in Matthew, the other question we got is math. So, so Mark appealed to the Gentiles, I believe. And Matthew appealed to the, well, now that's wrong, but you should appeal to the Jews. Um, but some people ask, how do you, why do you say that? Because at, really, at the end of Matthew, he says, you know, take this to all nations or something like that. So yeah, what makes uh, you yeah, definitely. No, you can definitely tell that Matthew is rewrite. Matthew did not like Mark. Uh, Matthew's very upset at Mark portraying that you don't have to follow dietary laws, that you don't have to, you don't have to follow Torah explicitly. So Matthew put things in there like, no, not one jot or tittle of the law is going to end. You have to follow everything. So Matthew, and then Matthew gives Jesus these five mosaic discourses, which are the five great uh, discourses, which are very pushing this message. No, only good Jews. You got to be a freaking Jew. If you want to join us, you have to convert to Judaism. And so when you get to, so it's very much an argument against Mark. Matthew is totally arguing against Mark. When you get to the Great Commission at the end of Matthew, when he says, go to all nations, he means go convert them to Judaism. And, and it's important to understand in context, that was a common thing back then. There was conversion to Judaism was uh, somewhat popular among certain factions of people. Um, and it was, there was very well set rules for it. It's explicitly Torah based. Uh, the Exodus has a conversion instruction in it. So it's in the law. Uh, and, and I just did an article recently um, on Israel only, which is a weird apologetic movement. Uh, but I have a whole section in there on adoption, uh, not adoption, on conversion, where conversion was very popular. Now, conversion to Judaism as a strategy died off after the Jewish wars because uh, Jewish proselytism became very unpopular uh, So and because of anti-Semitism. So uh, Judaism sort of dialed back and really doesn't look for converts. You can still convert to Judaism today. They, they, you know, there's, it, there's Talmudic instructions for it. You can do it, but they're not keen on it. Like the, 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 there's, there's, there's no effort to evangelize people to join Judaism. And that, that's sort of a cultural thing that grew up as a sort of defense mechanism to, to avoid uh, the hostility that would arise from that. Uh, we have something similar when you see in India now, the love jihad thing, the, the, where there, there is massive tensions between uh, Muslims and Hindus. 
where there's they're even trying to pass laws to forbid intermarriage, interfaith marriages, because they're seeing uh, the Muslims trying to marry Hindu women as some sort of secret mission to uh, convert everybody to Islam, right? Which is why it's not converting to Hinduism, anyway. Uh, but that that's the way they see it, and so there's great hostility, like violence and stuff arising from it. The Jews were facing the same problem after the Jewish wars. Any effort to proselytize started to, was getting a lot of violent pushback. So they sort of dialed back, and so that's why the Judaism we know today has sort of evolved into this very insular. No, you're born into it. Uh, you know, like converts are possible, but we're not really looking for any. Uh, but that wasn't the case in the first century. Conversion was common. Well, common enough. Like it was a thing that could happen. And so the idea was to fulfill God's destiny. Uh, Jesus is saying, yeah, go find everybody who's going to convert to Judaism. Uh, and, and then the end will come. And that, that was the idea, right? So, um, so that's, that's when people see that, like, go to all nations. Jesus is not say there, uh, uh, they don't have to convert to Judaism. Uh, he's just saying, go find everybody who will, basically, is what he's talking about. Because the rest of the book is very clear on what you have to do to join. Like, you say, not one jot or tittle of the law is going away. Like, you have to follow everything. Uh, and then there's some, he makes some exceptions, which are interpretations of the law, not abandonments of the law. And that's like the Sermon on the Mount is very much, well, what do we do now? Uh, when the, and, and it's it, ironic, like the Sermon on the Mount is covertly about how do we be Jews without a temple cult, which is how we know that the Sermon on the Mount was not spoken by Jesus. It was composed by someone writing after the Jewish war, after the destruction of the temple. They, they said, well, this is how you have to do Judaism now because there's no temple. Uh, now it's not, doesn't explicitly say that because it can't, uh, right, so then it would give away the game, uh, but uh, but that it's very clear. And Dale Allison and other scholars have, have noted this and analyzed it. And I talk about it in my book on the history of city of Jesus. But uh, but that's what's going on in Matthew. He's, he's saying like this is how to be a good Jew. Don't listen to Mark. Uh, and and then when you get down like when you're evangelizing, what you're going to do is you're going to go find converts to Judaism and also Jews who are in other nations too. This is because there's a lot of Jews in exile. And Matthew's written in Greek, so it's written for exiled Jews. It's written for Jews in other nations. Uh, by definition, mostly. So, so that's what's going on there. It's not a contradiction. It actually fits in the context once you understand the historical context that, that we're writing in. Okay, so the, the other question I've got is, although it doesn't feel like the gospel writers collaborated, in a sense, they must have been aware of, so, so obviously Matthew was aware of Mark's work. And oh, yeah. Of so how did that happen? Where, where did these writings and manuscripts go to for people to be able to read them. I mean, we're, we're yeah. Just, I mean, we would like to know the answer to that question, right? Uh, we don't know because uh, we don't have we, all the re letters that would have been written by Christian churches about what's going on in the church in that period are gone. So we have, we have zero information. And in fact, when you look at like the early second century Christian authors, they had zero information. They had no sources for what was going on in between Paul and the eventual edition of the, the canon. Like there's this they don't know what was happening during the writing of the gospels. No one really knows. Like we get later legends, but they're unsourced and they're implausible, oftentimes contradicting the evidence. So they're clearly made up. So they didn't have any sources either. So whatever happened, uh, I mean, my, my suspicion is the church shrank so much, uh, that, uh, this stuff was just lost. Uh, and it got, it was the gospels that reinvigorated, uh, the church in a sense that, that missionizing with the gospel sort of, they started rebuilding the, this declining church. Uh, and, uh, but that, that was still the competition between the Gentile faction and the Jewish faction uh, of Christianity. And yeah, Matthew sees, so Mark comes along, writes the story and he's missionizing with this. And Matthew or whoever, the Matthean community sees this as like, oh, no, 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 we can't have this. And so what they do is they rewrite it. And it's important to note that originally these don't have names on them, right? So they're rewriting it. They're actually representing their gospel as the original. They're essentially trying to say, Mark is a fact, Mark is a redaction of us, right? Even though it's the other way around. But they're trying to sell this. No, no, this is the true gospel. Don't listen to that. That's a, a shoddy like reworking that's pushing the wrong gospel. Follow this one. So they just rewrite Mark and then expand it and fix it up, basically. Uh, and so this is some other community. It's competing, a competing community with Mark. Luke does the same thing. Luke uh, doesn't like this battle between, he wants to unify the church. He wants to have the Jewish faction and the Gentile faction to get along. And he also wants the Romans to be less hostile. So, so Luke has his own version that, that he's, he's also arguing against Matthew. He's arguing against the argument between Matthew and, and Mark, right? Uh, and then John comes along and he doesn't like any of these people. And he's like, so they have their own community, their own point of view. And so they're pushing gospel. They have their own idea of how to push the gospel. So they invent their own, they completely rewrite it. 
uh, in their own words and the way they want to do it. And I say they because it actually says we. Uh, it's plural, so it ha John has multiple authors. Uh, and uh, and so they, they come out with their version of things. And of course, then it gets redacted multiple times. So the version we have is not even the original version written. Uh, and so that's how you get that. Now, the question is, and there are tons of others. We know there's about 40 gospels were written at the time. We, we don't have most of them. Uh, we just have names and vague descriptions at best. Uh, we have a few fragments of some of them. We, I think have complete copies of one or two, but um, so there were tons of other gospels. So the question is why these four because they're all arguing against each other. Why were these four brought together into a fourfold edition? Like, why were these the four that they're putting together and selling for the proto-Orthodox sect? And I do, I suspect it's political. Um, and it's the same thing that happened. And the reason I say this is because you see the same thing happen at Nicaea. In the formation of the Nicene Creed, they did exactly the same thing, where you start with the political assumption of who's in and who's out. You look at the creeds, of who's in and who's out. And then you merge them together so that your creed includes the people you want to include, but excludes the people you want to exclude, right? And so what you get is this completely Frankenstein's monster, this illogical, irrational, bizarre fucking creed uh, that makes no sense and was no one's creed. It was a completely new creed, but it's designed to include the people who are politically acceptable and to exclude the people that aren't. Uh, and, and that's what I think the, the uh, for, and by the way, it leads, it's contradictory, right? So it's contradictory, uh, creeds. So they took these creeds that are not together and they tried to fit them together and said, swallow this Kool-Aid. No, they trust us. They fit together. There's a way we can make it fit together. Trust us. Um, but they did that. It's all political. And so I think the gospels, they did exactly the same things, the same strategy. They picked the gospels that were promoted by the communities that they wanted to include in their faction. Uh, and by the way, the fourfold edition is a anti-Martianite edition. So they, Martian actually formed the first Bible, the first canon in the early 130s, 140s AD. And so he was pushing this version of Christianity. So all the versions of Christianity that were, oh, we, whoa, that's going too far. We don't like this Martianite stuff. They needed their own Bible to push against his. And so they got together, assembled their books and pushed their Bible. So what you have is that they're choosing who's in and who's out. So they, the faction behind Matthew, the faction behind Mark and behind Luke and by John, those factions were close enough in ideology that they could work on it. Uh, and were and so they excluded the Martianites and so on, right? So they 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 chose the, the the gospel selections that would bring the most communities in, without corrupting their main mission too much, and so they could still have uh, outsiders that they could push away, and so that's how we get this. And and yes, they contradict each other, and just like the creed, and they said, yeah, it was a way we could work that out. Trust us, we could figure it out. There's there, we can harmonize it. It don't worry about it, right? It's the same thing they did with the creed, and so I think that's how we got the the gospel we did. And there, this probably the Martianite edition might have looked similar, right? Like he's he's like trying to unify the churches that he wants to unify. We don't have his God. We don't have his uh, Bible. Um, we have references to it, some quotes from it, but we don't have it. Uh, and there may have been others, like other editions released by other sects. Uh, we don't have them. We only have really the one that that became successful, that that got Constantine's ear and became the dominant uh, religion. So that's the only one that we get. Uh, but yeah, that's that's how I think you get these contradictory gospels in there uh, okay. and what their purpose is. So when Paul wrote, he was writing to the church. Who was he writing to then? Was Because there wouldn't have been a church. Were there a 50 CE? Or, or... Uh, yes. Uh, so get a, what does word church mean, right? Yeah. So uh, there's no Vatican, right? There's no, there's no church hierarchy in that sense. Uh, there, there was a hierarchy. He mentions it apostles first and then he goes down the list of, of the ranks um but uh but it was much more loosely organized at the time now paul was doing something different from the other guys so the other guys they did have an evangelism outside judea but they were evangelizing to jews so they're going to synagogues in other cities and trying to convert them to this new messianic movement so that was going on uh and so that they created these sort of separate sort of factions these uh what do you call them, coalitions or whatever, uh, caucuses. So that in, within a synagogue, you would have this, these particular Jews would, would align with a particular sect, just as, you know, some would be Sadducees, some would be Pharisees, some would be, there's a variety of Jewish sects. So the idea of, of, of factioning into a sect while still attending synagogue was familiar. Uh, it wasn't a, a new thing. Uh, and so that, that's basically what they're doing. They're trying to create their own sectarian caucuses within synagogues. That's originally what they were doing. Now, Paul gets the idea that we can market this to Gentiles. Uh, we just cut out the whole convert to Judaism bit. Uh, and there's, I think you look in uh, the letters of Paul, there's lots of reference to Paul skimming money. Like he's, he's coming, he's walking off with money and a lot of people are suspicious about what he's doing with all this money. 
but if you're, if you're bringing Gentiles in, you're bringing in money, right? So that's another, that's also why I think the original apostles eventually accepted Paul's mission. So he's bringing them money. It's like, well, okay, you're Jewish or you're Gentile mission. We're going to accept it because of cash. I, I think that's what actually happened. I mean, obviously you don't explicitly say that, but I, I, there's a lot of subtext in the epistles. You can kind of get read between the lines. Uh, but anyway, that's he, so he starts expanding to the Gentile churches. So they they start creating their own communities. And so there's a book, um, by McMullen called the second, I think it's called the second church. I might be wrong. I can't remember. Is it McMullen is about the, the church below the elites so rather than reading all the church fathers and all the elite stuff, what was going on with ordinary Christians? Uh, and so he, he talks about like, well, where did they meet? Uh, what, and how did they set up rules for these things and so on? And he talks about like the, the churches, the ecclesia and Paul refers to the like the assemblies, but this means assemblies. Uh, it's just, and it's like, um, Jehovah's witnesses today. Like you have a kingdom hall, but they, what they would do is they, you would have Bible readings in someone's home. So you would, you would go into someone's home and usually the wealthiest member would offer their home because they'd have the largest home. Uh, and often we know that there's a lot of these, uh, uh, rich uh, benefactors were women. So some of these are, these are women who owned homes, uh, of significant size and they brought these congregations in and they often funded the church and so on. So when Paul is writing by the time Paul is writing in the fifties, he's probably not writing to synagogue factions anymore. He's probably writing to these independent in-home Bible reading organized around their own uh, ideas of Zionism and the future. And so they're, they're basically creating their own sort of simple grassroots church in a sense. And that's how it was. It took, you know, another hundred years before you got the elaborate system of bishops and, and you know, the, the chief you know, archbishops and you got the Pope and you got, they're now they're trying to enforce hierarchy and, and, and pushing out heresy. And, um, so that's all second century stuff. But in Paul's day, it's much more grassroots. It's much more uh, fluid, basically. So the other question, and this is quite topical because of what's going on in America, is from <laughs> a UK perspective and a European... For, for, people who don't, for people who don't know, we should mention that this is a day after the uh, attempted coup by yes. Donald Trump on the, on the, uh, the mm. Capitol building, but, um, which fortunately didn't, didn't, didn't go anywhere. Well. No, I think it was sung by Richard Dawkins who was saying... Um, to be the president of America, you have to be a Christian. And most intelligent people aren't Christians. Therefore, you're not going to get the best <laughs> president. Well, if you look at actually your education system, I've, I've seen um, lectures by PhDs who believe in creationism and believe the world is just several thousand years old, 6,000 years old, and don't, don't believe in evolution. How does that happen? Does that, I mean, why, <laughs> well, why? I'll start by taking issue with the with the previous line. I I don't think it's correct to say that you have to be unintelligent to buy into this. Uh, it, we actually have evidence it's the other way around, because uh, the smarter you are, the more capable you are of rationalizing a delusion. So so the people who are more out and about, the people who are in your face, who are doing lectures, who are arguing, they're more likely to be smarter than the average bear because that's what's kept them trapped. If you weren't that smart, you would, you would, as soon as the evidence against you hit you, you wouldn't know how to rebut it or come up with excuses to avoid it. And it would change you, like you would be deconverted or whatever. Um, when we look at studies that show relative intelligence among religious versus non-religions, the difference is very small, like 10 percentiles at most. And most of that represents the fact that most religious people are just the opiate, opiated masses, right? Like most religious people are undereducated, underfed, uh, uh, and it's the desperation of their communities that drives them to religion. Um, religion serves different functions for them uh, than for the elite. Uh, and so, so that's that when you average it all out, that's what you get. But I'll bet if you did IQ tests of Christian apologists, say, uh, and Christian professors and lecturers and so on, I'll bet their IQ would be above average. I don't, I think their average IQ would be above average. So, uh, so I don't think that's true. The problem is not intelligence. The problem is epistemology. Uh, it doesn't matter how, like the smartest person in the world can believe the most ridiculously false things and believe them adamantly, uh, right? It's because if you don't have the right method, the right critical method for assessing information and deciding what to believe and what not to believe. And that's a procedure, it's a, it's a technology, right? It's a skill, it's not an innate brain capability. Intelligence makes you more capable of using that tool. But if you don't have that tool or it's been replaced with a janky messed up tool, uh, then it doesn't matter how smart you are. Uh, you are not, you're going to be completely vulnerable to delusionality, completely vulnerable to being seduced by false information. Uh, and so you, it, you need the skill set and the passion and the values that compel you to always use that skill set 
you have to have those two things together and those are, neither of those are intelligence things. Uh, intelligence just makes it useful to use those things once you get them, but, but you gotta, gotta have them and we aren't teaching them in schools. We don't really have a critical thinking skill set being taught in our schools here. Um, our schools are underfunded as it is. American schools are not great, uh, especially, you know, they underperform all the other first world country school systems. And we're not teaching people how to think, uh, how, to, how to criticize uh, information, how to uh, be critical and skeptical and so on in, in a healthy, productive way, rather than a crazy denying everything kind of way. And, and that's, that's the main problem, I think. And, and there's, our brains are just inherently evolved to readily adopt a cultural assumption for community cohesion. Our brains are not inherently built to be rational. Uh, and so there, our brains can be rational because they're, they're good. We have a, what our brains did evolve to do is uh, develop and use tools, learn and use procedures and so on. So you can use that as sort of a back door to retrain the brain to be rational, but it is naturally prone to these irrational belief systems. And that's true regardless of religion. Like people focus on religion as the belief in the supernatural. I think that's actually declining. It's being replaced with secular irrationalities. So you have like the QAnon conspiracy theories. So let's talk about like the whole Trump supporter mass. And a lot of them are Christians and that part of that delusion as well. But an increasing number of them are secular. They have secular delusional worldviews that have all the same features of religion. They're based on mythology that they believe to be true, uh, like myths and stories that are made up that aren't true, but they believe are true and use as evidence for their belief system. Um, all of their apologetics, the way they defend their views against criticism and attacks is identical to Christian apologetics. It's, it's the same phenomenon. And when you see the exact same things, you see this is, this is a common human feature that we're seeing at that point. Um, the particular details, whether it's supernatural or not, that's just incidental cultural history. Uh, the, the actual phenomenon itself is something much more basic to the way the human brain works. It, it, the brain is defective uh, and, and it has to be fixed with software patches and you have to culturally push that. Not, not only you have to push the teaching of the fixes, but you have to push the value system that believes that those fixes are important to always use. Uh, and, and, and when you lack either of those things or both, um, what you end up with is, you know, people with delusional worldviews, and that can be toxic and dangerous in a lot of ways, as we just saw yesterday. Okay, that's interesting. That's interesting. Okay, so finally, a science question, because I don't, so although also a religious question. So, if you can, what did Christianity have a positive or negative effect on science? Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> We, we can do a whole show on that, of course, because yeah. this is also uh, this is a major specialty of mine. Technically, my dissertation is in that uh, vein uh, of answering that question. And my two books, uh, Science Education in the Early Roman Empire and The Scientist in the Early Roman Empire, both of those very specifically compare and contrast the pagan value system with the Christian value system and in, in the direction of answering this question. But the, I have some blog articles, too, for people who are interested in that. Um, I very much like exposed the faults in the narrative that Christianity was necessary for modern science. Christianity was always friendly with science. That's not true. It is also false that Christianity was never like abjectly at war with science either. Like it wasn't like Christian was super anti-science. They were never burning scientists. They weren't burning science books. Um, if they burned books or, sci or scientists, it wasn't for the science. It was for something else. But uh, so it's not that Christianity was at war with science in that sense. Uh, rather, Christianity is antithetical to science in its value system, such that it discourages what we call science. And I'll give you an ex example of what I mean. Um, when Christianity took over in the third century or fourth century AD, that form of Christianity, and we can show, and I show it in my books, the value system of that form of Christianity was anti-curiosity. Curiosity was dangerous. It, was, it led you to heresy. Uh, it was not, not a good thing at all. It was, everybody was suspicious of it and denouncing it as not a virtuous thing. Um, empiricism was not accepted because empiricism says that evidence trumps authority. They can't have that. No, authority trumps evidence, right? So like uh, the authorities tell you what the evidence means, period. You can't, you can't refute the authorities with evidence. That that's, goes antithetically to their entire hierarchical belief system, uh, faith-based belief system. They're very much faith-based epistemology. They're not evidence-based epistemology. Um, and then uh, the other is progressivism, the belief that you can make progress in scientific and technological knowledge uh, and, and progress in improving society and stuff through human means, that humans can make progress doing this stuff. The Christians not only didn't believe progress is possible, they also didn't think it was valuable. 
Uh, they were very much anti-progress and denouncing anyone who would think that you could make human progress in scientific knowledge. I mean, there are even outright statements like, if God wanted you to know it, he would have told you, therefore you shouldn't be wasting any time trying to figure this stuff out. Uh, there's, uh, there's explicit quotes like that uh, from Christian authors like Tertullian and others. Um, so these, these, but yet these are the three crucial values for science. You have to have empiricism, like it's fundamental. Uh, you have to have progressivism. You have to believe that you can make progress, that you can advance in knowledge. Uh, and you have to be believing curiosity is a virtue, that it's valuable and you should encourage curiosity. Curiosity is good. Uh, and, and I show that the pagans praised all three of those things. The pagans were big on all of those, uh, huge pushers of those ideas. And that's why ancient science progressed. It did slowly, but it, it progressed nonetheless. Um, and then it stalled when the Christians took over. So there was a, basically no scientific progress of any significant kind for about a thousand years. Uh, after that point. Uh, so all science stopped. And why did it stop? It didn't stop because the Christians started burning books. It stopped because they just weren't in. Uh, they didn't care. Uh, they, their value system just didn't support any kind of scientific advancement. They still used science. They used it like gospel, like old science was like craft knowledge that they kept using, but they didn't believe you could advance on it. They un misunderstood most of it. Like most of the knowledge decayed over time. They, they like the idea of science in the ninth century is shit compared to the idea of science in the second century, right? Um, and it, they only changed, they only started evolving back in, well, the Renaissance, what Renaissance meaning the rebirth of these pagan values, that people started pushing these pagan values. Now to sell them, they couldn't sell them as pagan values. They had to invent apologetics to sort of somehow argue the Bible's always supported them, and it didn't. But they would come up with ways to make Christian arguments for these values, but the values they got from pagans. And so all of the rhetoric was trying to invent ways to make this sound like it's Christian. And once they got the values back in, then science started reigniting again. They got the burners lit basically. And then, then you get science goes back on track towards the scientific revolution. And so that, that's, that's what happened. But you had that thousand years of hiatus of no scientific advances because there's just no interest. There's no one liked curiosity. No one liked empiricism. No one believed in progressivism or thought it was valuable. Uh, and so that's what happened. And so what you get in terms of destruction is just throwing things away. Like the, they tossed 99% of all the science that we got. They just threw it in the trash basically. And it's not like they actively burned it as evil. They're just like, nah, nah don't care, right? Just, just get rid of it. Don't waste any time copying it. Who needs that? Uh, and there was some hostility, like Origen says, never read any science books read, written by atheists, which was about half of all the ancient science, <laughs> right? So this, and his idea of an atheist is almost any Aristotelian, uh, for example. So, um, for you know the epicureans and atomists as well and so on and ecl certain eclectics and, and so forth but um so that impaired things like like steering people away from what they thought was godless and toxic uh but what you get as an example um one of the last surviving codices if not the i think it's the it was the at the time the last surviving codex of any of the works of archimedes or, or the leading works of archimedes um the last one was in about it survived up to like the 15th century there's only one left in the world which just the fact that there's only one left in the world tells you that they've just been throwing them away for hundreds of years. And so there's only one left. Uh, and what do they do? It's in a monastery, they're just, they're kind of poor. So they scrape all the ink off with a pumice stone and write hymns to God over it. And it's not like they said, oh, heretical science, get rid of it. And they just weren't interested. Like, oh, we need, oh, we need, uh, we need some fresh paper, scrape off the Archimedes, we don't need that stuff. Uh, and so they just scrape it off and they replaced it to hymns to God with hymns to God. So. That's so illustrative of the whole Middle Ages. That was their attitude towards science. Just scrape it off, replace it with hymns to God. Who needs that stuff? And that's why you get this. It's not hostility to science per se. It was just indifference to science. Um, now, hostility arose when ideology started clashing. And that's when science gets advanced enough that you got Galileo raising a stink. And, uh, and it's even before that, when Aristotle, when Aristotle started being taught in colleges, the Vatican shit a brick over this, right? So they got really disturbed, tried to shut it down. There was some negotiation and diplomacy and eventually they let it proceed under the understanding that the church's authority is absolute, that you can't use it. So they constrained how you use Aristotle. Basically they shut down empiricism. They said like authority, our authority trumps anything else. So you can't teach anything that contradicts us. But that was all politics, right? That was all you, if, if they're teaching something contrary to the Vatican, that's, just like the Christians assembling without a license under the Roman Empire, right? It's like you're, you're flouting our right to control you, right? You're, you're basically saying that you don't recognize our authority and we can't have that. Uh, and so it was, it was more about that than the threat of the ideology. Like it would have been easy, super easy to just change the geocentrism 
to a heliocentric Christianity. Super easy. There's, there's no, there's nothing in the Christian creed that says it can't be heliocentric. There's really nothing in it that says you can't be evolution, but uh, evolutionary, although there is, it raises a problem with the original sin argument, but the Catholic church came up with a solution to that. So you can get around everything. So most of the reasons when, when, when religion clashes with science, the reasons are usually uh, more political. They're more about who's in charge rather than the ideas. Now we have some exceptions. Um, if Christian opposition to uh, dominionist opposition to climate science, for example, um, the idea that we have a responsibility to curate the world where they say, no, God said we could do whatever we want with the world. That starts with politics. It's like, it starts with, we want to do whatever the fuck we want and then ends with a religious justification for that, right? So they, they end with it. So it's not like the dominionism causes hostility to climate science. It's climate science causes attraction to dominionism, right? So, so it's, it's always politics first. They'll present it as religion first, but that's the rhetoric. That's the way they try to justify their position. And you do this in abortion, stem cell research. It doesn't matter what it is, creationism, politics first, uh, and then religious justification and rationalization comes later. Uh, and, and it's often like, like creationism, it's you're threatening our authority. We're saying the Bible is the authority. You have to follow the Bible. You're saying things that, that contradict our, basically challenging our authority to dictate culture. We can't have that. Uh, and so it's more about who's in charge. Uh, than, than what the beliefs are. And so that's, that's what I see going on uh, with the interaction between Christianity and science through the last 2,000 years. Thank you. Well, uh, on that note, we'll have to wind up. It's been an absolute pleasure, an exceptionally good chat. Thank oh, you. yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. There's all good questions, by the way, things that uh, a lot of people don't know about, and I love spreading the views and knowledge and so they can think about it themselves. I'm, I'm pretty sure there'll be another interview coming up soon because i'm sure yeah, yeah sure i'm totally open to that yeah <laughs> thanks for having me on by the way it's it's nice especially it's good to have uh, a cheerful uh productive encounter with people in this particular day and age so <laughs> i'm very grateful for it thank you it's good to know thank you